This isn't a mag safe, right? I'd be very careful. If somebody trips, you're going to take your computer down with you. Hmm? Okay, folks. Almost time. So while we're waiting for the almost time, my two questions. Who's not in a group yet? I don't see a single hand go up. Everybody's in a group or you're too ashamed and don't want to admit it. Okay. Who's not picked a company yet? Come on, be honest. Really? This doesn't match up to your master list that I looked at this morning. I mean, if I believe that list, it's like what? 60% of you have not picked companies. So either the list is lying or you're lying. Or maybe the people are not lying or not here. That's always a convenient excuse, but there'll be an awful lot of people. So if you picked a company and you haven't entered the company's name on the list, please do. You're not locked in. It's not etched in stone. You can change your mind. Just do me a favor. Just put the company's name down. And at least you can get started. The worst thing you can do is not get started. So pick a company, get started. You can change your mind. Okay. So let's talk about betas. Now, I kind of dug a hole for regression betas, buried them deep, and hopefully today we will leave them there so they don't come back like the walking dead. Okay. But I have to tell you, of all the things I do in valuation, the one thing I get the most pushback on is betas. In fact, there are some parts, some audiences, all I have to say is beta, and I've lost them for the rest of the session. They've decided nothing else is worth listening to. So given that so many different people disagree with user beta or don't trust it, I'm going to give you a chance if you don't trust betas yet to take your choice on why you don't trust betas, because I might be able to give you a solution. So I'll give you four reasons why people give for, hey, I don't want to use betas. First is that they don't think they should be adjusting discount rates for risk surprisingly large percent of people who don't want to use betas want to use one cost of capital, 10% for every company, 9%. Where they come up with that number, I have no idea. They're like idiot savants. You know, they go, oh my God, I can, is that even politically correct? Whatever the right politically correct term is, they're like Dustin Hoffman in the rain, man, 9%. I know that's a cost of capital for every company. If you want to go that route and you want to use one discount rate, one cost of equity for every company, what should you be using? When we did the implied equity risk premium with this, you know what we do? We back out from the index and we say, right now, given how stocks are priced, if you want to use one cost of equity, at least have the good sense to adjust it over time because the number is going to move around. But I think it's extremely dangerous because we know some companies are riskier than others. Here's the second choice. And this actually does make sense from a consistency standpoint. What are we trying to do in intrinsic valuation? We're trying to make our judgment on what a company is worth and not be influenced by trading in the market, by pricing factors, right? That's why we do intrinsic valuation. Well, but how do we get betas? By looking at returns, which come from prices. So the argument is, why are we using a pricing measure of risk when we're doing intrinsic valuation? That's what, in when I do this session in Omaha, and I do it before, the, I don't go to the actual meeting, I do it for the people, the true believers who come. This is the biggest stumbling point, which is, I don't believe prices, why? No. So maybe that's the reason you don't like a price-based measure of risk, and I think that makes internal sense in terms of what you're trying to do. The third is, you don't have a problem using prices, but you don't like the implicit assumption we make when we use beta is that only the risk you cannot diversify away matters, right? Because implicitly that's what beta measures. It doesn't measure total risk, but risk you cannot diversify. Away. Maybe you don't like that assumption. 
And here's the fourth one. You're okay with both the pricing and the diversification argument. You just don't like the statistical noise and the backward looking nature of regression betas. On the fourth one, I can give you a solution. It's easy. But I'm going to start today by talking about choices you have if your promise with no two or three, which is you don't like the pricing approach and you don't like the. I'll give you a way of getting around it. Don't let this be your dunker, where you say, look, I don't like betas, therefore I will not do valuation. So I'll give you alternatives to betas. You can use them, you can not use them. So if you run into people say, I don't like betas, be willing to be flexible and say, okay, I'll use a different approach to risk. Because to me, this is a small piece in a much bigger puzzle. Before, I, you know, the other thing I want to talk about very quickly to put regression betas to rest is sometimes people think when they're estimating betas, they're doing statistics. Let me explain. This is a company called you know, Petrobras, big Brazilian oil company. I've estimated two betas for it. One is the beta against the Bovespa. And the second is the beta that I got by using the ADR, which is its listing in the US against the S&P 500. I've given you betas are very different. I've given you the R squared and the standard errors, the betas. If I ask you, which of these two betas is better? Anybody want to make a pick and tell me why? Because that's higher R squared, right? In the statistics class, aren't we taught that a higher R squared is better than a lower R squared? A low, And mathematically, that seems reasonable, right? But think of why the, the, the beta against the, Bovespa, against the Bovespa is more precise than the one against the S&P 500. What is it about it? Yeah. It's a big part of the index, right? It's like Nokia, perhaps not as much dominant as Nokia is. But if your end game becomes, I want to get the highest R squared beta, you will find it. It'll be a terrible estimate of your beta, but it'll make you feel comfortable. Don't make this an exercise of increasing R squared. If you get a chance, you get on a Bloomberg terminal. Have you found one yet? There must be something. You know, I don't even know where. I don't even have the energy to go looking anymore. They're there somewhere. One of the nice things about Bloomberg is you type the beta for your you know, type in beta for your company, you'll see that page, and you can start changing things. Change the index, you can change starting point, ending point. And if your objective becomes increasing your R squared, you will get there. But if your end game is incorrect, you're not going to get a beta that matters. It's going to be a beta that looks better in a statistical way. So I'm going to go back to the main packet, and I think we're on page 83, maybe. Yeah, I think we're on page 83. And give you some options. And these are options you might want to use, but have them as options in case you run into somebody who says, I don't like this beta thing, do something different. So the way I'm going to divide the options is I'm going to ask you what your problem with betas is. In fact, this is exactly the question I ask in, in Omaha. You don't like betas? Tell me what it is about betas that bother you. About two thirds of people say it's the fact that you're using past prices. Okay. So I'll take prices out of the mix, but if I take prices out of the mix, I have to use something else to estimate risk, right? What's the most obvious, if you think in intrinsic terms, what might be a better measure of intrinsic risk instead of stock prices? Earnings, right? So you can look at earnings over time and risky companies should have more volatile earnings and safer companies should have more stable earnings. Everybody agree with that? And I've tried it, in fact. It's not difficult to do. I compute the standard deviation earnings for every company that's publicly traded. And I don't trust standard deviations in earnings for a very simple reason. What, do, what are accountants trained to do when you get distortions? Smooth them up, right? So you have an expense, you spread it out over time. I understand why they're doing it, but the nature of accounting is to smooth things out over time. You see where I'm going? When you have a risky company, accountants will counter that riskiness by smoothing things up. I wish I could tell you that companies with more volatile earnings are riskier, but that's not what I see in the evidence. But if you want to go that route, I'll go with the route and I'm gonna give you something that looks like a beta. Here's how it'll, it'll work. I'll compute the standard deviation in earnings. Let's say it's 40%. I'll compute the standard deviation earnings for every other company in the market. Let's say it's 30%. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take the 40 divided by 30. I'm going to give you 
1.3. It looks like a beta, right? But it's based on a counting onyx. So there are people who use a counting onyx, but remember earnings are measured only once every quarter in the US. So you're gonna only get four observations per year. So if your company's been around only three years, you'll have 12 observations. They get smoothed out. And sometimes they do strange things, unexpected charges, extraordinary charges. So it's not a panacea, but if that makes you feel better, I'll go along with earnings. Here's a second way in which you can come up with a cost of equity. You have a cost of debt that might be observable. Banks lend you money, you have an interest rate. You can say, look, I don't want to play these games. I'm just going to take the interest rate at which I borrow money. And if I'm a risky company and I have a high cost of debt, I'll also have a high cost of equity. Makes sense, right? Intuitively. For some companies. If you're a very risky tech company with no debt, this approach, you're going to say, well, there's no cost of debt, so your equity must be pretty low. Cost of equity must be pretty low. The problem with this approach is you're effectively going to, it's going to work maybe for infrastructure companies with a lot of debt, but with most other companies, a cost of debt-based estimate of the cost of equity doesn't make much sense. I'm not trying to talk you out of it, but I'm saying there's no, there's no alternative here. That's perfect. Every alternative you pick is going to come with cost. You got to decide what your poison is. So when you think about you know, price-based measures, you don't believe them, then of course you can go. If you stay with price-based measures, you say, I believe them, and you don't like the CAPM, that's your, the, the, the battle you want to fight, then finance has lots of alternatives. There are arbitrage pricing model, multi-factor model. Essentially, you're staying with price-based measures, but coming up with the cost of equity. So if you want to use an arbitrage pricing model or a multi-factor model to estimate your cost of equity, am I going to fight you? No, I don't think it's going to make much of a difference to your eventual valuation. It makes you feel better. I'm okay with it. Let's move to the other half. What if you don't want to make the diversification assumption? So when you, when you don't want to assume that investors are diversified, then again, I'm going to ask you, okay, if investors, you don't worry, if you don't want to make, make, make that assumption, are you okay with price-based measures? If you say yes, then I have a simple solution to the beta problem. Beta, look at only the portion of your variance that is due to the market. That's what a covariance in that regression does, kind of hidden in the regression. I'm going to take your total standard deviation. A little later in this class, we're going to come back and talk. I call this a total beta. So what I do is I look at your last three years of stock prices. Your standard deviation in stock prices is 50%. And the typical US stock, a standard deviation of 20%. I'm going to divide the 50 by the 20. I'm going to come up with, eventually I want to come up with a number that looks like a beta, right? There's an advantage to having a number scale round one. But if you want to get a chance, explore those. There are a dozen different ways I can estimate cost of equity that don't require a beta. And I need to move on. So if this is where you make an issue. I, no, I don't like beta as a measure of risk. I have solutions. So when you look at alternative models, you can bundle them into either relative standard deviation models where you look at total risk. You can look at what I call proxy models. In proxy models, you tell me what type of company you have. Small company, lots of physical assets. I'll give you a cost of equity based on your character. That's what a proxy model does. In fact, one way a proxy model works is you tell me what sector you're in, technology, I'll give you a 12% cost of equity. Why? Because I think technology companies are risky. And finally, if you want, in some cases, you can take the model that we went at, risk-free rate plus beta times risk premium, but you end up with a number that you think is too low. You start adding numbers to it. Appraisers use things like small cap premium. What is that? You're a small company. You must have a higher cost. Let me add 4%. You're in a liquid company. I'll add another 3%. Basically, you're pushing up the discount rate to a point where you feel comfortable. I don't use any of these alternatives because to me, they're an opening for bias. Remember we talked about how bias can affect evaluation? This is a process where you're making not just subjective judgments, but judgments that back up your preconceptions. So I'm going to stay with the cap and with all of its weaknesses and limits. But if you don't like it again, remember there are alternatives. This is not an approach that rests on you accepting the cap M as the only way of measuring cost of equity. And if you want to go the accounting route, you trust accountants. 
then there are earnings histories. You can use them. Again, there's a lot of smoothing out that happens. You can use income statement numbers like earnings, or you can focus on balance sheet numbers. How much debt does a company have? High debt companies, you consider risky. You know? And if, you, if that is what you feel gives you a better estimate of risk, go ahead and use it. Just try to scale it so that you know whether your company is risky or safe. In a value line, which used to be one of the more widely used investment services, kind of fallen out of favor now. It's been around since the 60s. Used to classify stocks into five groups based on risk. From one through five, not particularly creative, but essentially the argument is we'll put the safest stocks in one, the riskiest stocks in five. And they had some kind of weighted judgment they made based on earnings and cash flows. If that's what works for you, classify companies into five groups and put them based on, give them cost of equity based on risky or safe, I'm okay with that as well. As long as you risk adjust the discount rate, you're 80% of the way towards me. Why would I make beta the, the battle I want to fight? Or I said, that's the only way to get a cost of equity. So the reason I'm, I'm spending even this time is for many of you, when you do a DCF, People will get caught up in this beta thing. And I'm just saying, let it go. It's not the battle that you want to fight. So ask them, okay, what do you want me to use instead as a risk measure? Bring that in, show them the value doesn't change that much. And most of the time it will not. And kind of move on to the next phase of evaluation. So now I'm going to circle back and redeem regression betas. You know, when, when you ask people, where do betas come from? You know, people who use betas. Every, I had one banker try to tell me where babies came from. I said, no, no, betas. I know where babies come from. I have four of them. And you know what the reaction is? You ask a banker, where do betas come from? They, say, they look at you like I have two heads. What do you mean, where do betas? They come from Bloomberg. They come from Barra. Because let's face it, once you start working, betas come from services. Nobody sits there and runs a regression. But betas don't come from, from Bloomberg or Barra. They don't even come from regression. They come from choices you make as a company. So I'm going to dig a little deeper and talk about what is it that causes some companies to be more exposed to market risk, which is what a high beta is, and some companies to be less exposed. And there are three choices. There are only three that a company makes that determine what its beta should be. The first is what kind of business are you in? Think about it. Betas measure how you move with the market and the economy, right? So if you're in a cyclical business, you should have a higher beta than if you're in a non-cyclical business. Historically, cyclical business, you had housing and steel and automobiles and non-cyclical, you had food and you know, household products. And until about 30 years ago, this is the only line I used to draw, cyclical on this side, non-cyclical. But the world is getting messier. So I'll give you another distinction that, that I think works better. The more discretionary your product or service is as a company to your customers, the higher your beta will be. You know what I mean by discretionary? If your customers can live without your product, they can delay buying it, they can defer buying it, you should have a much higher beta than if they cannot do that. So I'll give you a sector where you can see this play out. Let's take the retail sector, huge sector, right? Lots of different companies. I'm going to break these companies into four groups. And I want you to rank them in terms of, based on what we just said, which of these groups should have the highest beta, which should have the lowest beta. So you have luxury retailers, Gucci's, the Tiffany's of the world. Then you've got department stores. There are not that many left, but there's still a few. Then you've got discount retailers. Let's say grocery retailers are also in the mix. Which of these four groups should have the highest beta? Yes. You can live without those Gucci's, trust me. I know you feel you will die if you don't get them, but who are you, Kim Kardashian? Luxury retailers are going to have higher betas. Why? Because it's going to much be, so they're going to do much better in good times and much worse in bad times. Who should be second on the list? Probably department stores, which should be lowest on the list. Grocery retailers, right? You can live without your Gucci's, but I don't think you can live without food. You can experiment and see how long you last, but it's not going to be that long. But to show you even within 
sectors, you can have differences. Let's take the grocery sector. You got Safeway and Kroger and you got Whole Foods and Sprouts. So if I were looking across these companies, which grocery store should have the highest beta and which one should have the lower beta? Why do you go to Whole Foods? Because you feel rich. You say, I have a lot of money. I'm willing to pay three times what I should be paying for eggplant because I get organic eggplant. You lose your job. All of a sudden, you say, you know what? I'm going to die anyway. I'll go to the discount store. I'll get the eggplant that they have in that section, you know, half used eggplants. I'm okay with it. You should expect Whole Foods to have a higher beta than a Kroger. I want you to start thinking in those terms because you told me you've already picked the company. I'm going to trust you when you said that. I want you to think about what your company makes and sells and ask how discretionary it is and raise some interesting existential questions for you. Like, can I live without my Netflix? I will let you figure that out. But those are the issues we haven't tested yet. I mean, many of these big tech companies have never really been tested, right? We haven't had a severe recession in a long time. We're going to find out if there's a recession, how discretionary your DoorDash is and your Netflix is. So we're going to get a testing mechanism, but think discretionary, non discretionary. Yep. Yeah, what about? Yeah. So let's say you took, you have a Ferrari? No, you don't, right? What, you know, what about a Maserati? No, not that either. Maybe a Rolls. No, but you can see the same phenomenon applies, right? Mass market automobile companies will have lower betas than luxury. The Ferraris and the Maseratis are so selective and we'll come back and talk about them. They're really not even discretionary. They're like an exclusive club. They won't even let you in. They definitely won't let me in. I live in a part of the world, La Jolla, where you walk out. I walk by five luxury auto companies. I'm terrified of actually trying to go into one because they might check my credentials. So how many billionaires do you know? None. Get out of here, right? Okay, so, but if you look at a, a Daimler or a BMW, they've tended to have more volatile sales than a Volkswagen. So within the automobile sector, you have variations. And I would say the same thing about electric cars, right? This is one of the big challenges that Tesla faces. It might dominate the electric car space now, but it's still, what, what does a Tesla 3 cost? $45,000, $50,000? You cannot become a mass market automobile company, even in the US, and forget about becoming a mass market automobile company in India or China with that price. So one of the challenges for Tesla is going to be, how do you bring prices down, not just to produce more revenues, but to make yourself less discretionary? It's not so much a wide range, a lot of BMWs, but they're all expensive, right? You need, if you're from all the way from luxury to mass market, then you're probably safer than one that's just luxury products, right? So ranges matter if you're appealing to a much broader group and making your products and service less discretionary. Yes. pandemic, we all lost our minds. I would take 2020 out of every single analysis we do because we were doing weird stuff, you know, because it might be that we were so attached to our phones in that period. In fact, I think we got more attached to our phones and our family and friends that, you know, so the pandemic, I think, is a strange period because we were stuck at home. We had nothing to do. And God only knows what happens when you do that with you. But I think if you look at every, you know, every historic downturn, every crisis, the companies that get hit the first are the luxury companies. It happened in 2008. This, if there's a recession in 2023, that's what I'd look for. It's definitely not going to look like 2020 anymore. So that was an aberration, I think, because of the nature of that crisis. So that's a first stop. Tell me something about your product or service. So I want you to think about whatever product or service your company produces, eh? is it discretionary, is it not? Yes. They're low risk. That, I, so you've answered my question, right? Which is, can you live without your legal drugs? I use the word legal in front. Okay, 
That's a good question. Now, if you look at, at, at diseases, there are multiple treatments for a disease rate. But the thing is, in the US, patients don't make those choices, right? It's through a doctor and an insurance company. So pharma is this messed up space because you have this intermediary. If you have good insurance, you're going to get the right drugs, whether your, your job is shaky or not. So it's become the system based on what kind of insurance you have. So pharma companies historically in the US have had low betas because they tend to be things you can't live without. And insurance companies seem to pay in good times and bad times. That could change. Maybe if Medicare becomes the leading payer for medicine, that could affect you know what would have. But right now, at least in the US, not a particularly discretionary product. In fact, this discretionary, non-discretionary econ classes, you had a different name for it, right? What, what does that measure? Elasticity of demand, right? Every class you ever take in the school is in service of my class. Only reason that econ class even matters is because it taught you about elasticity of demand and it affects evaders. So thank God for that class. Forget the rest of the class, take that piece out of the class. Let's take our second stop. Tell me something about your cost structure. What does that mean? Remember, every company is fixed costs and variable costs. The greater the proportion of your costs that are fixed costs, it's called operating leverage, the higher your beta is going to be. Intuitively, why is that? Why is having a lot of fixed costs going to increase the beta for your company? What do fixed costs do? In good time, go ahead. Exactly, right? If you have mood swings, think of having a lot of fixed costs as making you bipolar, basically, because your moods are going to swing. I mean, in good times, you're make, going to make tons of money. In bad times, you're going to lose tons of money. Businesses with a lot of fixed costs will have more volatile earnings, more variable earnings. And I'll give you my favorite example of a business that's, in a sense, almost defined by its cost structure. It's the airline business. Look at a typical airline, it'll go down its cost. With each one, tell me whether it's a fixed cost or a variable cost. First, you've got to lease the aircraft. Fixed cost or variable cost? You can't go to whoever you lease. You know what? Our planes are half full. We'll pay you half the lease. It doesn't work that way. Fixed cost. Fuel cost. Fixed cost or variable cost? Once you've decided you're going to fly from New York to LA, you can't come and count the number of people on the plane and say, only eight people on, let's fill it halfway. Let's see how far we go. There won't be eight people left on the plane after you do that. I know there's some variation depending on load, but you're going to burn through the fuel, whether there are eight people on the... So fuel costs, mostly fixed costs. Employee expenses. You unionize airline. I've been on flights where I've been outnumbered by the stewardesses. Doesn't improve the service any, but you're outnumbered. There are five of them. Only... Remember, I used to fly after 9-11. There'd be three people on the plane, five stewardesses. Didn't make a difference to the service, but still a fixed cost. So guess what you get for airlines? Feast or famine. Notice the airlines never have a normal year. They're either making billions or going bankrupt. I've never seen airlines ever have, a... oh, this is a normal year for an airline. It's essentially, this is a great year or we're going bankrupt. So the more operating leverage you have, the higher your fixed cost, the higher your beta. Which brings me to my third and final stop. Yeah. Well, it's a function of the oil price, right? So there your cost structure stays the same. So oil companies last year had an astoundingly good year in terms of earnings. Oil companies in 2020 had an astoundingly bad year because it's not the, just the infrastructure costs. Operating the oil the rigs and getting oil out of the ground is an expensive process. And I think that cost stays fixed whether you're taking out you know three barrels or 300 barrels. So with oil companies, again, you get those wild swings in profits. I thought you were going to ask me, what about in, even with the airline business when you have an outlier? You know the, uh, who the outlier in the airline business, right? The company that's been written about in more cases than any other company in history. 
Anybody want to guess what that company is? Southwest. Now let's think of what Southwest does that's different from a typical airline. First, it leases its aircraft, but for the longest time, every single Southwest aircraft was a Boeing 737. You know why they did that? Because it meant that they could keep one maintenance crew on every, and didn't have to, because every aircraft is unique enough that you got to bring in you know, different maintenance crews. Fuel costs, I hope they don't economize because I do fly Southwest sometimes. I don't want to be 20 miles from my destiny. I say, sorry guys, we're running out of fuel. Okay, that's not a great outcome. They are a unionized airline, but they're the airline with the most flexible workforce. I've seen stewardess, have you ever been on United where the stewardess alert checked you in? Never. I mean, you could be surrounded by them. The podium could be falling apart. I can't do that. I've been working here 27 years. Never checked anybody in before. I'm not going to start with you. Southwest, you know, so you actually get an adaptable workforce. But for the longest time, Southwest created a template for the airline business that kept their costs low. I remember the first time I flew Southwest out of the New York area, and I'm using that word deliberately. So I make this reservation to fly from Southwest from New York to LA. Got a cheap flight, very happy day of the flight comes about. And I'm glad I checked in time because I'm checking which airport am I flying out of? Oh, it's not Newark, it's not JFK, it's not LaGuardia, it's at Islip. If you're from Islip, I don't mean to insult you, but I had no idea where Islip was. It turns out to be the small town in Long Island that they flew out of. I've managed to get a cab to that town, cursing Southwest all the time. Get on the plane, say, thank God I'm going into LA. I land in LA, come out, and there's this gigantic statue of John Wayne in the middle. I said, this isn't LA. It turns out to be Orange County Airport. And they did this in city after city, right? You fly out of one, and why did they do that? What is the benefit of doing that? How do you get to fly out of Newark? I mean, have you ever been to Terminal C in Newark? It's a, con it's a United Terminal, it used to be the Continental Terminal. It's like 200 gates. And they do things like fly you into gate seven and give you a connecting flight in gate 153. I think they do it just for laughs. I think there's some guy upstairs with a, with a camera on you say, look, she's never going to make it. Let's switch the signs on her. Okay? It's like a hundred gates in there. And how do you think United keeps those gates? It pays airports for those gates. They're expensive, it's a fixed cost. And for the longest time, Southwest said, we're not paying that fixed cost. You fly into Chicago, you're still flying to Midway, not O'Hare on Southwest. And this is a pattern that other discount airlines have copied elsewhere. If you go to Europe, please don't fly a discount airline. You think you might be flying into Paris, but you're flying into the rough vicinity of Paris. It might be a hundred miles away and you get out and say, how do I get there? And say, just start walking. Maybe three days from now, you'll get there. But the higher your fixed cost, the higher rate. And Southwest deliberately created a model to keep fixed cost down. You know how this manifested itself? The month after 9-11, Southwest had a higher market cap than all of the other airlines put together. It's the only airline that showed any chance of surviving that downturn because it had the most flexible cost structure. Or another example, you know, hospitality business. Hotels are bound down by a lot of fixed costs. The one big advantage Airbnb has over a Hyatt or a Marriott is they have a cost structure that's completely flexible. They don't own that. So during, during the 2020, when people were doing crazy things, that was a perfect time for Airbnb to go public because their advantage over the rest of the business was greatest. Second stop. So what business are you in? How much fixed cost do you have? Third and final, yes, go ahead. First, there are two things in a farm, right? One is whether you can predict how much your crops will be, right? And that's, in, in much of the world, that, that part is, the, the variance in that is low. So what's driving the variance? It's what the price of corn is, what the price of, 
in the U.S., you know how farmers stay in business is because the U.S. government steps in and provides price guarantees. They have to, otherwise farmers would just go out of business. The fixed costs are so large, you would not make it through downturns. So agriculture around the world, that's a big factor. The more commodity prices swing, the more difficult it becomes for a farm to continue because of a huge amount of fixed costs. That cost is not going to go, go away whether you have low prices or high prices. So it's a question that's around the world people have to ask. A, 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 a factory farm run by a corporation is a better shot because they can diversify, right? They can own farmland in, in Iowa, they can own farmland in Australia and things can average out. But an individual farmer is completely exposed, which is why there are fewer and fewer of them left around the world. Which brings me to third and final question. So what business are you in? What fixed cost do you have? How much have you borrowed? You see why this question is relevant? If you own equity in a company, when you borrow money, you create a fixed cost you did not have until you borrowed the money. What am I talking about? What's a fixed cost that arises the minute you borrow money? Interest expenses. You got to make it in good times, not a problem, but you also, unfortunately, banker seems to insist you make it in bad times as well, right? It makes your equity earnings more volatile. You can take a safe business and end up with risky equity if you borrow enough money. So here's what I'm going to do to bypass regression betas. I'm going to take what I've learned about the drivers of betas and say, rather than trust one single slice of history and one regression, I'm going to build up to a beta by looking at what business it's in, what its operating leverage looks like, and maybe how much it's borrowed. So let's start with the, with, with the first step. We're going to start with the beta of the business. If you're in the steel business, you didn't invent this business. It's been, been a business that's been around. There are other companies in the business. I'm going to look at risk at other companies in the business to get a sense of how risky is this business. Now, if you happen to be a business like any other steel business, I'll assume your fixed cost and variable costs look very much like any other. But if you're like a Southwest, you've got this new way of doing business, then I've got to factor in the difference in operating leverage, that you're a steel company with much more flexible costs. And finally, I'm going to say, how much have you borrowed? And I'm going to try to bring that into your beta. Sounds like a, lo a lot of tasks. So let's start with the first of those tasks. Am I missing a page? Okay. So let's talk about the second step in the process, adjusting for operating leverage. Did, did I skip a page? Was there an 87? I've been losing pages as I go through. Okay, so we're okay. okay. We're 87 is the page that I'm, that, okay, we're okay there. Okay. So let's talk about how to adjust for operating leverage. You understand the logic, high fixed costs should have higher betas. There's actually a mechanism for adjusting for leverage that we know how to use. So if you tell me what the fixed and variable costs are of every company in a sector, I can tell you how much lower Southwest beta has to be than other airlines. But what did I say you have to know? How much fixed and variable costs are in every company? I challenge you to pick up an income statement for any company and break costs down into fixed and variable. Because accountants don't break costs into fixed and variable, right? There's cost of goods sold. There's a, you can try to guess and say SGNA probably fixed, R&D, I have no idea. The problem is not with adjusting for operating leverage, it's getting the information. I'm preemptively going to make a confession, which is, when I look at companies in a sector, I'm going to assume that they all have the same operating leverage, not because I want to, but because the information to differentiate across the companies is just not that. Question, I'm sorry. Um, so if you're starting out with like a new data, isn't mm -hmm. the industry data inherently calculated through regression? It's calculated through a bunch of different regressions. You're actually good. So in fact, I'm going to get to that point. Of, how is this a solution to the regression beta problem? Because to get an industry beta, what did I do? I took a hundred regressions and I averaged the beta. I've already given you one of the clues as to why an industry beta is better than a single regression beta. But, but I'll come and back it up because that's a very good question. How is this getting us out of the regression beta problem? Because you know, getting those, those betas for individual companies, you still need it. So adjusting for operating leverage, I know how to do it, but I just don't have the raw data. But on financial leverage, there is a way I can adjust betas and the data is there. 
when you borrow a lot of money, you know where it's going to show up is as a high debt to equity ratio. And I'm talking entirely in market value terms. So you more you borrow, the higher the debt to equity is going to be. When you run a regression, you get a beta. You get what's called a levered beta. What does that mean? The beta reflects not just the business you're in, but how much debt you took on. So if you can tell me how much debt you have as a company, I can tell you how much higher your beta should be given that debt. So the equation that gets used, it's called the Hamada equation. It's been around 50 years. It's to basically start with the beta of the business you're in. So the unlevered beta is the beta of the business you're in. And then bring in the effective debt through your debt to equity ratio. And the higher your debt to equity ratio, the higher your levered beta. You're saying, what's that one minus T doing in there? Why is there a one minus T in that equation? Debt is a fixed cost, but the government stands by your side and say, you know what, I'll give you a little benefit here. You have 500 million in fixed in, in interest expenses. You get a tax savings of 25%. You're really paying only 375 million. That equation is built on the premise that all of the risk in a company is borne by its equity investors. That lenders are there to get a contractual claim. That there are, that, that's not a bad assumption until you get to really risky companies. You know why, right? If you lend to a really risky company, your debt is going to start to behave like equity. Your claim, instead of being a contractual claim, will start to look like a residual claim. You'll get whatever's left over because you don't want to push them into bankruptcy. So there will be cases where people say, well, you're making a strong assumption here. You're assuming the beta of debt is zero. And my response is, okay, so tell me what the beta of debt is because there's a version of this equation which is almost never used where if you know the beta of debt, you can adjust the beta of equity for the fact that sometimes debt, to, debt carries some of the risk of the business. So let's review. So to get around regression betas, I'm going to start with the business beta. Adjust for operating leverage if I have data and fixed and variable costs. And then adjust for financial leverage using the simple equation, and if you really push me, the more complex equation. Either way, I'm ending up with the beta that reflects the business you're in, your operating leverage, and your financial leverage. So here's my way of estimating beta. So this is the only way I've estimated beta for 30 years. I've never, I haven't used a regression beta to value a company in a really, really long time. I compute what's called a bottom-up beta. And to illustrate the process, I'm going to let you be my guinea pig. So you started a business, you started a company, it's in two businesses, pick any two. What two businesses would you like to be in? So you want to be in healthcare, you want to run hospitals, you want to, no. Okay, so you're in healthcare, so what's the other business? Okay, so you want to be in healthcare and hotels. And you say, look, you want to know your beta, I'll say I'll be back tomorrow. Here's what I do. I go back to my office. I find as many publicly traded healthcare companies as I can. And the reason I pushed you on what aspect of healthcare is, if it's hospital, I look for hospital companies. If it's emergency clinics, I look for clinic companies. I find 100 companies publicly traded that are in that business. I find 100 publicly traded hotel companies. And if they're publicly traded, what can I look up at each of them? A regression bait on each of them. I take the average regression beta for the 100 healthcare companies and the average regression beta for the 100 hotel companies. I have an average beta for each business. Remember that beta I said is reflects the business they're in as well as the debt they've taken on. So I'm going to look at the debt to equity ratio for healthcare companies and the debt to equity ratio for hotel companies. I'm still staying with a comparable list and I'm going to take out the effect of debt. Sounds fancy, but it's called unlevering a beta. I'm taking out the effect of debt from the regression beta. I'm almost there. I now have an unlevered beta being hotels and healthcare. I come back to you. Okay. You told me you're in two businesses. How much value do you get in each business? And your reaction might be, I have no idea, but I got 70% of my revenues last year from, from healthcare and 30% from hotels. Help me out now. What do I do next? I take a weighted average. 0.7 times a healthcare beta plus 0.3 times a hospital beta. I now have an unlevered beta for your company. Then I ask you a final question. Do you have any debt? What I'm hoping for is your answer is, I have no debt, in which case I'm done, right? But if you tell me you have debt, I compute your debt to equity ratio and lever your beta up to reflect your leverage. It's called a bottom-up beta. 
And now let me get back to the question. How is this saving me from the regression beta curves? Instead of one regression beta, all I've done is used an average of 100, right? What is one of the issues I had with regression betas? Big standard error, right? So let's say I have 100 betas, all of which have high standard errors. And I average those 100 betas up. What is the standard error of the average going to look like? In this case, help me out. She picked 100. If I picked 100, I made your life easy, right? It's going to be one tenth the standard error of any regret. One tenth because square root of 100. If I have 100 companies in my sample, I've now created a beta that's 10 times more precise than any individual regression beta. So, my first reason for using bottom up betas is I got more precise betas. Here's my second. What is the other problem I had with regression betas? It reflected your company as it used to be. You told me you're in two businesses. Let me fill in the details. Let's suppose you entered the hospital, the healthcare business yesterday. You did it because you did an acquisition. Until then, you were just a hotel company. If I run a regression on your company's stock price, I'm going to get the wrong regression beta, even if the regression beta is right, because I'm going to get a beta for you being in the hotel business. But if I do bottom-up betas, I get to set the weights. In fact, I can ask you, what are your plans for next year? Maybe you want to start a software company. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take a weighted average reflecting how much software is going to be of your business tomorrow. Not only do I get a more precise beta, I get a beta that reflects the business mix you are in and that you plan to be in. And here's my final bonus. If I have to value Porsche, which recently went public, man, there's no regression beta, right? It's not even a choice, it's not listed. I can now estimate the beta for a company that's not listed because I don't need past prices. I just need to know what business you're in, how much debt you have. A bottom-up beta is not a panacea, but it removes many of the issues you have. You still have to deal with the diversified investor part if you don't like that, but it makes my life so much easier because when I sit down to value a company, I'm not running 15 regressions on Bloomberg. I'm looking at what business is here and I'm coming up with the bottom-up beta and then I'm moving on to the cash flows. Yes, question. How would you play around with an average of 100 numbers? It'll require a lot of playing around, right? Can you pick a sample that gives you... If you Remember what I said up front? If you have strong enough bias, you're going to find a way through any system. But here's what I, I would suggest you do. If you know people do that, and you're on the other side of the table, and they show you a list of 27 companies as the companies they used to get the beta, you know what the question you need to ask them is, right? Did you start with 27? They will lie and say yes. But the truth is they probably started with 60 and started shedding high betas, low betas. But you know what? If bias is that strong, no approach you use is going to be immune from it. But at least you'll be less effective. You know what will make you? What will make your suspicions high is if you have an infrastructure company with a beta of 0.3 and the average is 1.1. You can see the average yourself. You don't have to have this guy tell you the beta for ports businesses or airports businesses. You know, if you go to my website and click on data, and I've been doing this for now 25 years, you can get the beta by industry group for every publicly traded company in the world. I give you global averages, US averages, and it's built into every one of my Excel spreadsheets that I do for valuation. And I do it because it gives me perspective. It tells me when I'm, Using a number that's unusual for a sector and forces me to explain why. Okay? So you're right. People will play games, but you don't have to let them play games. You can compute the average yourself. You have capital IQ. Have you open, start, created, started your access to capital IQ yet? No, right? Do it now. Okay? That is the advantage of capital IQs. You can pull up every steel company. In 15 minutes, you can give me the beta for steel companies. You don't have to let other people drive the agenda because it's easy to push back. So my argument for bottom-up betas is they're less noisy. It's 
smaller standard errors, they're updated. They reflect the businesses you're in and the businesses you could be in. And I can use them for private businesses, divisions of companies. I now have a toolbox that I can use to do valuation of much wider array of cases. So let me give you a few examples of bottom-up beta calculations. The first is a beta calculation I did, and this is, I do use this company in my corporate finance class, a company called Vale. It's a mining company. It's Brazil-based. It's, it's one of the, it's the largest iron ore mining company in the world. But it also is in a bunch of other businesses, other metals, fertilizers, logistics. So I valued Vale a few years ago, and I wanted to get a beta for the company. I took its businesses. I looked up publicly traded companies and I used global samples because these are businesses where it competes against companies elsewhere in the globe for the same market. Do I get the law of large numbers working for me? God, do I have the law of large numbers working? Look at the fertilizer business. I have 693 companies. I didn't prune the sample. Why would I prune the sample? And that's actually suspicious. When people start pruning samples, you got to ask, what's your end game here? So if you have a good reason and say, I want to look at small fertilizer companies because they're riskier than large companies, I'm willing to listen. But he said, I took all the companies whose names start, you know, started with C and D. I'm not willing to listen because that seems awfully arbitrary. There are the unlevered betas for those businesses. So that's what I report on my website. So this is the time saver. Once you've estimated them at the start of the year, I'm not redoing it every time I do evaluation. And the beta for Vale is a weighted average of the betas of the different businesses they're in. That's a question I asked him, what weight? No, if you're in a hurry, you can use revenues to weight the, the businesses. But the problem with revenues is then not, don't always go with value. If you're a high margin business, you'll get a higher value for the same dollar in revenues than if you're in a low margin business. So here's my quick and dirty way of converting revenues to value. Remember all those publicly traded companies I pulled up to get my betas? I also have the market values of these companies it's called enterprise value. That's a market's judgment on what these companies are worth. I can look at what multiple of revenues publicly traded companies trade at in this space. So a typical metals and mining company trades at 1.97 times revenues. I take Vale's revenues from metals and mining, multiply by 1.97, I get an estimated value for each of the businesses. That's what becomes the basis for my weights. And based on my looking at Vale, this looks like a company about 77% iron ore mining, 16% metals, and 5% 5, 5 fertilizers, and 1.76% logistics. The only rule you cannot violate is you better make sure your weights add up to 100%. Because otherwise, all kinds of bad stuff can happen to you. No matter what weighting mechanism you use, I'm okay with it as long as the weights add up to 100%. Yes. I'd be very careful about pruning outliers. Did everybody get a question? Let's say you're, you know, you sit in front of a Bloomberg terminal or S&P cap like you, you pulled up 50 companies, you notice one company has a beta of 3.3. You say, I'm going to take that out, it looks high. You know, the danger of that is if you want to take that out, I'm going to ask you to look at a beta of 0.2 because you want to take it out. Then you take out the 3.3 and, and 0.2, you know what's going to be the outlier, the 2.2. This is not a game I want to play. The larger your sample, the less you care about outliers. So go for bigger samples. That's the advantage. Because with small samples, outliers can be a factor. And there's a simple fix for outliers, right? Instead of using the average, what should you use instead? Just use the median. It's a much simpler fix. You won't have to worry about outliers. No. But essentially what you're doing is replacing a single slice of history, one company with this average across companies. So my beta for... For Vale, across the businesses, you take the weighted average is 0.84. I use the debt to equity ratio for Vale to come up with the levered betas, not just for the company, but for each individual business. Why do you think I want betas and cost of equity for individual businesses? One is if I want to value each business separately. Second is, in this case, Vale actually was thinking about selling its logistics business. And if they called you and said, hey, value the logistics business, I want a beta and a cost of equity for the logistics business. So when you're in multiple businesses, this is a way in which you can get a beta for the company. And it's, it's good work because it'll make you understand wh what does my company do? Where does its value come from?
Now, there's a, there's a, there are a couple of mechanical questions I want to kind of address here in terms of doing this, because you know, this is something I've described a long time. People do it, and you know, sometimes they run into at least this issue. Now, this was actually a beta that I was computing for Embraer, Brazilian aerospace company. So initially I said, I want to find publicly traded companies like Embraer. And if you go to S&P Capital like you, you can actually constrain your search. You can say, find me all aerospace companies. And initially I said, find me all aerospace companies in Brazil. And I ran into a bit of a problem. You know what the problem was? Only one company showed up, it was called Embraer. This is not helping me, I'm replacing Embraer. I said, find me all aerospace companies in Latin America. Came back with one company called Embraer. And then ask, why am I staying geographically frozen? Embraer makes aircraft that it sells in Europe, it sells in the US. It competes not against other Latin American, it competes against Bombardier, it competes against, you know, even, even, even the smaller jets that Boeing produces. I said, it's a global aerospace company. Increasingly, when I value companies, I go to my global averages. I get two benefits. One is, I'll always find lots of companies. So the law of large numbers requires large numbers. That's useful. But the case of Embraer gave me a way of getting betas, which was, so when somebody says, I can't find enough companies, first question to ask them is, how are you defining companies? And often you see, you know, Peruvian analysts, I'm looking just at Peruvian companies. Of course, you're not going to find enough companies. Same thing with the Portuguese market, right? Small market, just expand your search. So when you think about, hey, my sample's too small, and that's why I want you to get access to S&P Capital IQ, because you can play with that screen to see how it changes as you put in additional screens, take screens away. Okay. So to the question of, can I use the unlevered beta for US and European companies to look at Embraer? I don't see why not. And here's why. What's the average beta across all US companies? It's about one. It's about one because it's a weighted average. What's the average beta across all Brazilian companies? It's about one. Beta is not supposed to carry any risk measure. The reason I say that is I've seen analysts that say, I'm going to go use a higher beta for Brazilian companies because Brazilian companies are riskier. Not the right place. If you're worried about risk with Brazilian companies, what's the number you should be adjusting? The equity risk premium, betas were not meant to carry the risk in a company. They're going to be scaled around one. So don't worry about using developed market company betas to look at emerging market companies or emerging market company betas to look at development because betas scale. I mean, the best way to think about it is you have 10 rooms of students and within each one, you get the weights of every student. You can't compare the weights across the rooms if some rooms are filled with obese students and others are with undernourished students, right? But what if I took the weight of every student and divided by the average weight of the students in the room? That's what a beta does. It gives you a relative measure of risk. So a beta 1.2 in a risky market is much more worrisome than a beta 1.2 in a safe market because I'm going to multiply by a much larger equity risk premium. Here's the other one. Now, if you work in Latin America and Europe and even parts of Asia, people prefer to use what are called net debt ratios rather than gross debt ratios. Let me back up. When you think about a debt ratio, as a debt to capital, you take total debt outstanding divided by you know, equity plus debt. That's a gross debt ratio. In a net debt ratio, what you do is you take the debt and you subtract out cash. That's what net debt is. And you use that net debt number, which would be a smaller number than gross debt to compute things like debt ratios. Sounds like it should be consequential, right? If you take uh, Briar, for instance, their gross debt ratio is 19%. Take total debt. And if I use that gross debt ratio, the beta that I get for Embraer, starting with the aerospace company beta is 1.07. The net debt ratio for Embraer is minus 3.32%. You know when you get neg negative net debt ratios? What has to be true? Just look at the equation. If cash exceeds debt, you're going to have a negative net debt ratio. Apple has a negative net debt ratio. In fact, all the tech companies have negative net debt ratios. If I use a negative net debt ratio, I'm going to end up with the unlevered beta. 
No, this, I'm sorry, a levered beta that is actually lower than my unlevered beta. Sounds weird, you're saying, well, I'm bringing that in. Well, net debt ratios can be negative. Now by itself, you're saying this is gonna make a big difference to my cost of equity, you're right. Your cost of equity with net debt ratios will be lower than your cost of equity with gross debt ratios. But remind me again what the rest of the process requires. I have to take that cost of equity, put it into a cost of capital calculation, right? So your cost of equity gets multiplied by the weight of equity. Your cost of debt gets weighted by the amount of debt you have. If you use gross debt ratios for Embraer, you're gonna have a higher cost of equity, but when you do your cost of capital, you're gonna get this weighting down effect because 15% of your company comes from debt and the cost of debt is much lower. You're gonna end up with a lower cost of capital. If you use a net debt ratio, let's play it out. You're gonna end up with a lower cost of equity. But when you do your cost of capital, you know the weights for equity and debt are going to look like with a negative net debt ratio? You're gonna end up with 102% equity and minus 2% debt. You're not going to get the benefit of cost of debt weighing you down. You're going to end up with, the, if you don't believe me, try it out. The cost of capital you're going to end up with for Embraer is going to be roughly the same whether you use gross or net debt ratios, which means pick one, just stick with it consistently. Don't go back and forth. I prefer gross debt ratios when I do you know, levered betas and keep cash as a separate asset. But if you prefer to net them out, many, Euro as I said, many European Latin American analysts do, I'm okay with that as long as you do that all through the analysis. So let's summarize where we are. If I asked you for a cost of equity, three ingredients, right? What risk free rate should you use? Let me add here. So when I ask you what risk free rate, If you're doing an analysis in US dollars. So first thing is, it depends on your currency, your risk-free rate. And in some currencies, it's going to be more work than others. When I ask you what equity risk premium are you going to use, what's your answer going to be? The equity, what equity risk premium should you use for a company? For the US or for where the company operates? You have to take a weighted average of where it operates. So your risk-free rate reflects your currency choice. Your equity risk premium reflects where in the world you operate. And what is your beta capture? What kind of business you're in, how risky it is. Everything has its place in your cost of equity. Don't mix and match. Don't bring in country risk into your beta and your risk-free rate. That's why it took out the default spread from the government bond. It's to prevent the double counting. So risk-free rate, beta is equity risk premiums, lots of moving pieces there. But go back and review the last 60, 70 pages of notes because they were leading up to this page of here's how we come up with risk-free rates, here's how we think about equity risk premiums, and this is how we get betas. Any questions on cost of equity? The best way for this to stick is do this for your company. Otherwise, you say, I kind of get it. I you know what? If you kind of get it, you don't get it. Man. This is to get it. It's got to stick. You've got to do it for your company. And that's why I keep nagging you. Pick a company, do this, because until you do it and get your hands dirty, it's really not going to stick. So that's your cost of equity, right? So what you pay, what you're costing out the equity portion, that's complete the other half of the picture. There's another way you can raise capital, which is you can go and borrow money. So I want to deal with the question, what's your cost of debt? And I'm going to lay out the principle that's going to govern how I think about the cost of debt. The cost of debt for a company is the rate at which it can borrow money long-term today. Let me repeat that again. The cost of debt for a company is the rate at which it can borrow money long-term today. Key, two key words there, long-term and today. Let me take the first one, long-term. Companies can borrow short-term or they can borrow long-term, right? Most of the time, which one will look cheaper, to borrow short-term or long-term? Most of the time, borrowing short-term is cheaper because the term structure is usually upward-sloping. That's not true this year, but in most years, you've got an upward-sloping term structure. So if you let CFOs pick tenor for their debt, and you told them, look, we're going to attach a cost of debt based on the maturity of what you borrow. You know what you're going, they're going to do, right? They're going to take all the debt, make it short term and tell you the debt got cheaper. So I'm going to avoid that. I'm going to say, look, tell me how much debt you have. I'm going to attach a long-term cost. What's it today? 
bring into the process. I mean, if you look at a company's existing debt, some of it was borrowed in 2022, some in 2021. And if you look at the interest rate on that debt, what are you going to see? Lower numbers than you have today or higher numbers? Risk-free rates were much lower, risk premiums were much lower. The 2021 debt and the 2022 debt is going to look like it's much cheaper than today. I'm not going to let you use that as your cost of debt, even though you already have it on your books. I'm going to recalculate the cost of debt as if you are borrowing money today, which means I'm going to start with today's risk-free rate, which is 3.5%, not the 1.5% you saw a year ago, and add on top of that a default spread. So cost of debt is a rate at which you can borrow money long-term today. To see, how do I get that? If you have a company that has bonds outstanding, they're trading. It looks like you have an easy, it's like a slam dunk. You're saying, I know what the cost of debt is. All I have to do is look at the yield to maturity in the bond. That should be a rate at which you can borrow money today. And that's technically true. But here's why you should be cautious. Can a risky company issue a safe bond? No, you don't think so? When you are a bondholder, what do you look for to decide how safe it is? You look to see what secures it, right? Their general obligation, but you also look at the assets behind it, the cash flow. So if I have a risky company, but there's one very safe, let's say there's a government contract on which it's guaranteed earnings and cash flows and it issues a bond backed up by its safest segments, you're going to get a much lower interest rate on the bond than you're going to get on the company. This is why Moody's and S&P, in addition to rating companies, also rate individual bonds. You can have a single A rated company issuing a double A rated bond and a triple B rated bond at the same time, because it depends on what's backing up those bonds. So if you decide to go with a bond, be careful that it's not a bond that's an outlier, that it does. But I'll give you an easier way. If you have bonds outstanding, you also have something else observable outstanding you can use to estimate your cost of debt, which is a rating. Is it, do companies have to have a rating to issue bonds? Is it a requirement? No, you can actually issue bonds without a rating. Nobody does though. You know why? Because if you decide not to go for a rating and you decide to issue a bond, what's the signal you're sending to markets? I don't want the ratings agency to look at my numbers and you then build. So almost every company that has bonds outstanding, in fact, many that don't have bonds outstanding still are rated because they do it pre preemptively just in case. You see how this helps you and me when we do evaluation, right? So when I ask you how risky is a company from a debt perspective, you have two choices. You can do all the dirty work yourself of computing all the default risk measures and the ratios, or you can trust Moody's. Be honest with me, which of those two pathways looks more attractive to you at the moment? I, I'll be honest, every single time I get to the stage, the last thing I want to be doing is being a fixed income guy, projecting you know, earnings for the next 50 years and figuring out default risk. I know Moody's is not the sharpest knife in the drawer, but you know what? It's there, it's free, and saves me so much time. Could that get you into trouble sometimes? Absolutely. If you have a rating for your company, you can use it to come up with a default spread. And once you get a default spread, you got your cost of debt. So when you think about cost of debt, if you have a rating, your life got simple. You use the rating to come up with a default spread. An increasingly large percentage of companies have bond ratings. It used to be at one point in time that US companies had bond ratings, but outside the US, Companies did not, because even in Europe, companies used to borrow from banks. So, but as, as, you know, as recently as 25 years ago. Now, of course, bond markets have developed in Europe, they've developed in Asia. You have ratings for about 30%, maybe 35% of global companies. But that still, still leaves you with 65% of companies, primarily in emerging markets and parts of Europe where you don't have a rating for a company. Now you're saying, oh my God, what do I do now? I don't have the crutch I usually use. I'm going to give you a very simplistic way of coming up with default spreads for these companies. 
for a brief moment in time, I want you to be act like a ratings agency. You're going to be Moody's for five minutes, but you have only five minutes to do this. Moody's claims to use eight financial ratios to come up with the rating. In fact, for the longest time, you we went to the Moody's website, they would list out, or the S&P website, they'd list out the eight ratios, EBITDA to fixed charges, EBIT to interest expenses, debt to capital, and so we use these eight ratios. And one thing I've learned by looking at these services is they like to throw a lot of noise into their measurement mechanisms. So I said, okay, maybe use these eight ratios, but I'm going to try to reverse engineer what you really look at to come up with your ratings. I downloaded the ratings for every rated company and the eight ratios they claim to look at. And then I did a little sorting. I sorted into AAA, AA. What I was trying to figure out is, hey, can I reverse engineer how they came up with these ratings by looking at the ratios? And here's what I saw with non-financial service companies. With banks and insurance companies, a different game altogether. Non-financial service companies, one of those eight ratios seemed to be carrying the bulk of the weight and the other seven were along for the ride. So this is a purely empirical statement. I'm not saying this is a good ratio, but the ratio that best explains differences in ratings across non-financial service companies is called an interest coverage ratio. <clears throat> it's a very simple ratio. You take the operating income earnings before interest and taxes and you divide by interest expense. So the higher this ratio, the safer you feel as a lender, right? You got more buffer. So this ratio is seven, you've got $7 of income for every dollar in interest expenses. You feel much safer than if this ratio is three. Now for Embraer in 2004, that ratio is 3.56. I'd use an average across time because the income is all over the place. You know what that number was for Adani last week before the Hindenburg group? 1.42, right? And it's not unusual, infrastructure companies. And does it mean they're going to go bankrupt? Not necessarily, but you don't have a whole lot of buffer, right? Because if your income, operating income drops by 30% or 35%, you're already below the interest expense, which means you've got to come up with the money somewhere. You don't have to default, but it's... I can compute the interest coverage ratio for every company. I don't need a rating. I don't need a ratings agency. This is operating in Dubai by interest expense. If you can compute an interest coverage ratio for your company, I can guess what the rating for your company is. Remember I said I started by looking at ratings agencies and reverse engineering what they did? One of the things I did as part of the reverse engineering is I built a lookup table around the interest coverage ratio. You know what a lookup table is? You tell me what the interest coverage ratio is based on how ratings agencies attach ratings. I'll tell you what a rating will look like for your company. My interest coverage ratio table in 2004, and the 2023 version is on my website. If, you, if you're a large company, so there are two sets of numbers here, one for large and one for small, because life isn't fair. If you're a small company, you need a much higher interest coverage ratio to get the same rating. So if you're a large company with an interest coverage ratio of 5.75, your rating is going to be A+. If you're a small company with an interest coverage ratio of 3.60, your rating is going to be double B+. So you see what I'm going to do. If you don't have a rating, I'm going to take your interest coverage ratio. I'm going to look up the rating that goes with that interest coverage ratio. And once I do that, then I can get a default spread and a cost of debt. So the 65% of companies that don't, if, if your company has a rating, don't go looking for trouble. You don't need a synthetic rating. Trust Moody's to have looked at more than just the interest coverage rate. But if you don't, this is a quick and dirty way of coming up with the rating and a cost of debt. In the case of uh, Embraer, for instance, with the 3.56 interest coverage ratio, the rating I gave them was A minus. It's a purely synthetic rating based on, so 3.56, let's see where that is. No, there it is, 3.56, an A minus rating. A minus rating gives you a default spread of 1%. But there's one final piece of this puzzle that's a little messy. That 1% default spread is what I would charge as a default spread for the company. But Embraer is a Brazilian company. This is another one of life's big unfair, you know, unfair blows. If you're an emerging market company, you carry two burdens on your shoulder. One is your burden in terms of company risk, so there's a default spread. But do you think the fact that you're a Brazilian company or a Greek company might affect your cost of debt as well? That's why I said life's not fair. You're a Greek company. You walk in, 
you tell the bank, I'm a Greek company, the bank says 30% interest rates. I haven't shown you my financials, I'm really strong. 29% maybe. In fact, for the longest time, ratings agencies in the US used to have a sovereign ceiling on your rating that no company in a country could exceed the rating of the country you were in. Can you imagine that poor Venezuelan company that's struggling right now because their rating is C or stuck at C? Ratings agencies have removed the explicit ceiling, but implicitly it's still there. When you look at how they rate emerging market companies for the same numbers, you will get a low rating. And this isn't a conspiracy. They're doing it because this is an extra burden of country risk in your analysis. So the long story here is my cost of debt for Embraer starts with the risk credit. I was doing it in US dollars, adds a 1% default spread for Embraer, but also brings in a portion of the country default spread. Why only a portion? Because Embraer gets 70% of its revenues outside or 97% outside Brazil. I would expect to be less exposed to default risk than a company that gets all of its revenues in Brazil. It's like a Lambda playing out here. But when you do cost of debt for emerging market companies, there could be two default spreads, one for the company and one for the country. So that's the cost of debt. I will leave you with one final question. The, rate, the table that I developed came from looking at all rated companies. And when I first did it, it was a US table because I was only in US. But I used to use it all over the world. And as long as you didn't have interest rates, which are very different from US interest rates, I felt comfortable. If your interest rates are much higher, it gets messy. So when you start on Wednesday, we'll talk about how do you adjust synthetic ratings for the fact that you might have 20% rates or 30% rates? Because things do get trickier. Yeah. Yeah.